Hi, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about Hashi. Uh, it's a framework we, we're developing uh, with a goal for securing bridges by distributing trust. So let's look a bit at uh, the state of, of the bridges ecosystem. There are around or more than 30 bridges currently live on EVM ecosystems that secure uh, around 4.5 billion in TVL. Um, and from a security perspective, vast majority uh, is based on externally verified, so multi-six MPCs and such variations. There have been, yeah, of course, security issues, favorite topic uh, when we discuss bridges. Um, the last couple of years, two, three years, there's uh, 2.5 billion uh, lost in token bridge exploits. Um, and in general, uh, in the top five biggest hacks of crypto, four out of the top five are bridges. Um, out of these 30 plus bridges that are around right now, um, the vast majority are yeah, multi-sigs or variations of uh, externally trusted uh, parties. And there is only a handful of optimistic or light client-based uh, ones. So one could assume that maybe that's the issue, right? Um, so let's, let's look at some numbers. Um, and this is a statement that yeah, many uh, can, would say the last year, especially, that trustless bridges and L2s would actually solve this issue. Uh, will they? <laughs> so this is a list of, uh, I believe, yeah, if not all, the vast majority of bridge hacks that happened last couple of years. Um, and we can see highlighted um, are the 20% of them, so three out of the 15, um, related to compromised keys. Uh, so compromised keys, yes, it's, it's an issue related to trusted external assumptions, so multi-sigs and MPC and several variations. But the vast majority of the hacks were not due to the, the multi sigs right? So due to, um, they were due to smart contract bugs. Um, simil such bugs are very common in cutting edge technology. So we should expect and prepare uh, for such issues on both new trustless bridges and also for L2s. So, uh, the users, so this is what users are doing. Um, the, uh, we see clearly uh, uh, here that the L2 is TVL, so the user adoption there is growing and there is a downtrend on the bridges. And the, of course, there is there's uh, an argument, there is a reason to do so. Um, but we need to keep a couple of, uh, a couple of points here in mind. So first of all, smart contract bugs uh, on this um, uh, new tech uh, were not found, but yet, right? So the same was with bridges, by the way, till the first big uh, hack happened. Uh, there is a still single point of failure on this tech. So if there is uh, one bug found in one um, a critical smart contract, the whole uh, bridge, and not only the bridge, but the whole ecosystem will fail. Um, so one could say that, in general, reliance on, on bleeding edge tech um, is not battle tested enough. Um, let's look at also some learnings from Ethereum protocol development. Um, it's, it's stated uh, quite often that client diversity is not optional, right? So here are the, the execution. So consensus and execution clients, there are different implementations, right? Um, in different programming languages. Uh, why do we do that? Why do we need multiple implementations of the same protocol? And are they, if there's just one, is this not dozens times audited? Is not enough? Uh, here the main, the, the answer is essentially that um, if there is an issue found in one of these implementations, uh, in the compiler of specific language, for example, in the Golang, uh, then there would be a critical systemic risk for the whole uh, ecosystem. And Ethereum has grown so much as a, a settlement layer that we take this little possibility very seriously. So uh, one point here is that we, we want to start taking bridges as well with the same seriousness. So we need to look at the client diversity. And, uh, a key takeaway question here, maybe a rhetorical question is, is it a higher probability of a bug in the Go compiler or in a highly complex math basic circuit? 
some conclusions uh, and observations from what we discussed so far. Um, all bridge designs have trade-offs. There's no like good design and bad design or good bridge and bad bridge. Actually, there are bad designs, yeah, but uh, there's, there's always a trade-off. So every, every design uh, tries to optimize for something, for security, for uh, speed, for cost. Um, second point is trust in just one mechanism, in one implementation is not secure enough, even if dozens of audits are done. So we need a more robust and resilient, resilient approach to securing bridges. Um, and if we summarize all of this in a couple of uh, words is, yeah, 100% bridge, uh, secure bridge does not exist. So this is why, this is why Hashi, this is where Hashi comes in. Um, and we build this framework with the following design principles. So security first and defense in depth. So we optimize for security. Um, we focus on client, and in this context is security layer uh, diversification. Um, and we want to offer redundancy and protection against multiple issues. So compromised keys, malicious behavior, including governance, um, erroneous message passing, and of course, smart contract bugs. And we'll see how we'll, we'll do that. Um, we call Hashi like the additive security approach. Um, that essentially means that we, um, we base the cross-chain communication on, yeah, simple set, like multiple inputs, multiple, we call them oracles, adapters, multiple sources. Um, the main goal is to distribute the trust, not to trust just one specific implementation um, of, of the cross-chain protocol, but multiple ones. And a third point, standardization. Um, we want to offer standardization at the lowest possible level, which is the block hash. Um, we want to do that because this is the only level where multiple cross-chain implementations, not only messaging bridges, but also light clients or oracles can um, basically work together. Um, a couple of key features. So the framework is uh, modular and agnostic to any kind of underlying mechanism. That allows us to, uh, to plug there in uh, general message passing bridges um, yeah, by the way, what is a general message passing bridge? As you can think about like a wormhole, uh, the Gnosis A and B, uh, layer zero, uh, seller, and um, uh, connect, like all, all of these are message passing uh, based. Uh, but also we wanna use uh, and integrate with light clients and oracles, even like Chainlink, for example. Um, and allows communication at two different levels. So the block header approach, as we mentioned before, which is kind of a low level, but allows all these uh, to, to work together. So like a light client can work together with a messaging protocol. But there is also a more simplified version um, where you can just use generic message aggregations or get a couple of um, messaging bridges, don't, not work with light clients, and uh, just aggregate them and make sure that uh, they give you the same answer. Um, so here there's a clear trade-off, um, security and robustness over latency and cost. So clearly this approach is uh, more expensive, it's slower, but is far more secure. And last uh, feature is like the two governance uh, models that we offer, and I'll go into details um, yeah, in, in one more slide. Um, the, the approach to defense in depth, like how, what are the, our weapons? Um, to offer multiple times of defense in the security. So many different uh, general message passing implementations, any kind of bridge that offers um, a message passing mechanism can be integrated uh, due to the modularity of the framework. Multiple uh, light client implementations, M of N uh, threshold. So imagine like something like a safe, like a multisig, right? So. Um, you can, you can have a, I mean, if you want to optimize for security, you can have like a four out of four, so you expect uh, forces of input to, to agree on something. If you want to optimize for resilience, you can go two out of four and so forth, so you, you have this flexibility. And the last one is minimize the governance attacks uh, by limiting the governance powers. And here I'll explain with a simple, uh, simple uh, state machine uh, what I mean. So 
this is not a yeah, topic not, not analyzed enough, but every L2, every bridge, I mean, essentially every system has a governance mechanism for upgradability, right? So no matter how trusted it is, most of the system, they have a multisig that can go upgrade the whole thing, change the configuration, kind of a admin thing, right? And the, the current best measures around in the market are delay on upgrades, like a couple of days or something. Uh, we took, so of course we offer this approach, this is quite, quite simple. Uh, but we, we took it a step further. Um, we thought how, like, if we prioritize security first, we need to, yeah, look at this um, uh, attack vector as well. And we want to minimize the governance powers. Um, so what this uh, state machine shows is you, you have a governance multisig and you have initialization state, like you have to initialize the system, you have to give the initial parameters, what kind of bridges, oracles I want to use, what kind of thresholds and all this kind of stuff. Then you have two states, two operational states. One is the green one, so like normal operation, and we call it quarantine state, which is something is wrong, so something gone wrong. So a multisig can, of course, initialize the system and in a normal operation state, the governance cannot do anything, right? You cannot just go there and upgrade any kind of implementation or change an oracle or, um, or a threshold. But there are scenarios, um, and yeah, we can, one can imagine a bunch of those. Uh, an oracle, a specific bridge does not um, uh, provide any information. So it's like dead, it's down, it's hacked, whatever. Or provides erroneous information. Or a light client needs to be upgraded, and so forth. So. If such a scenario is triggered, then the system goes into a quarantine state, and then the governance can, uh, or the multisig can just, again, jump in, um, fix the system, essentially, so um, change any oracles, adjust the, uh, um, the thresholds, and bring the system back to, to the normal state, where it has, essentially, no, no power. Um, yeah, and here I want to show you, like, yeah, now a kind of an end-to-end example of a token bridge, how it would work on top of Hashi. So we have to, to change to, yeah, that's here in this case is Ethereum and Gnosis chain, it can be any kind of EVM. Um, how would you bridge tokens, right? So here we have, on the Ethereum side in this example, uh, we have two uh, message passing bridges. One is Wormhole, one is our own canonical and Gnosis uh, message passing bridge. And we have also two light client implementations. So what we're doing is we're not trusting just one of them. So right now we just trust A and B in Gnosis. Polygon is the same, and you know, and so forth. They trust their own uh, implementation. So here, what we do is we send essentially the same message through all of these um, oracles, um, which is the block hash in this case, because we work with the light clients. All of these messages go with different kind of security infrastructure and different models on the other side. And there is where we have Hashi and its governance module, where we have all this configuration we mentioned before. And if everything go goes well according to our configuration, for example, three out of four of these oracles agree on the specific header, then I can consider this header or this message canonical. Therefore, it's safe to mint tokens. So we think this model offers a far more um, superior in terms of security model. Uh, for bridging tokens. Um, this is a more simplified version how to imagine Hashi. So um, it's, it's based, uh, like a, there's an analogy, right, with a ride model, so in hardware drives. So you had two hardware drives that you store the same things, and if something happens to one hard drive, you, you, you can rely on the other one. So same concept here. So you can say that Hashi is like a redundant array of hash oracles. So um, you, you essentially have the same, you, you ask for the same information, for the same input from different sources, different implementations of cross-chain uh, protocols, and uh, yeah, if one is compromised, is down, you can rely on the other. What's Hashi's current state? Uh, so we have a testnet live and five integrated oracles from the ones I mentioned before. So if you're interested, you can uh, go check it out, play around. Uh, it's on girl in Gnosis chain. Um, and, and of course, if you're developing something or if you have ideas, feel free to reach out. So, uh, and in progress, we, we have several interesting um, uh, applications. Some of them are in early stage, some of them in later stage, such as cross-chain safes, uh, governance use cases, cross-chain uh, swaps, and of course, the token bridging I mentioned before. And I want to show you a little bit the, I mean, from the examples I mentioned before, I think they are quite vanilla, and this is a bit more exotic. Um, 
so what are the cross-chain saves? So you have, uh, so here you have Ethereum and you have Gnosis Chain. And you have the main save on Ethereum mainnet, and you have a secondary save from Gnosis Chain or anywhere else in any other kind of EVM chain. Uh, using Hashi, um, you can essentially control the secondary uh, save on Gnosis Chain without doing any transactions on mainnet. We know like mainnet uh, is expensive, for example. You don't want to do a lot of transactions there. So how is this done? You use Hashi to bridge the state of the chain of Ethereum to Gnosis Chain uh, in the most secure way possible. And over there, you can perform some proofs and essentially control uh, your secondary safe using these proofs um, Yeah, just by transacting on, on the secondary chain. Um, and yeah, what's next? Um, so apparently, yeah, it's, it's mainnet deployment. So it's, we are quite ready to deploy in mainnet. Uh, we're also growing the team uh, and working further on that. Um, in terms of diversification, as I mentioned multiple times, this is the, um, the main value proposition here. So we're gonna keep integrating more oracles, more uh, bridges, more, more implementations. Uh, also, not only on the security level, but also on the execution, uh, so on the message passing. So before, we, we focus most, mostly about how do you bridge state, uh, but there is, also, um, um, there is also the message passing mechanism, like what do you do with the state? How do you execute messages? And the, there can be issues also on that level. So we want to have multiple implementations on that level as well. Um, one of the biggest milestones is to uh, get the Gnosis Omnibridge, as is right now, and upgrade it and secure it with this model, uh, which will up upgrade the security of the whole chain, essentially, not only the bridge. Um, expansion to major EVM ecosystems, and also not, uh, not EVM, but it is quite, quite easy to do. Um, eventually offering secure assets, with the example I mentioned before, and also cross-chain uh, governance use cases, which is something that we've, we've seen, yeah, m many DAOs have been exploring this, uh, especially last year. Um, yeah, and that's it. I mean, I wanna mention here that we're hiring. We, uh, if you guys are interested to work on that, uh, feel free to reach out either on Gnosis side directly or to me. Um, yeah, and also we can, if you have any questions, yeah. can. Thank you, Georgios. And we, yes, we have about uh, five minutes for questions here. Any questions for Georgios? So right here and down in front. We have a Dave. microphone for you. I was just curious uh, if it makes, uh, given the additional verifications on the bridging, if it makes the bridging more uh, gas intensive or if it has any impact on like uh, the cost for the user to bridge? Yeah, yeah, v very good point. Uh, totally. Uh, so again, there is a clear trade-off here. So um, it's a part, yeah, it can be in, th in theory four times more expensive if you, if you use four oracles. And yeah, one challenge that we, we see is, okay, bridging outside from Ethereum to any other chain, it's kind of manageable. But then anything that goes back to Ethereum mainnet, especially updating ZK Lite clients and stuff, is extremely expensive. So yeah, we're working towards improving that and finding solutions because yes, it's, it's quite expensive. Over here on the right-hand side. Um, thanks for the talk. How will you deal with uh, varying bridging times? Will the slowest bridge determine when this oracle can give an answer? Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, that's, that's a, a very good point. So Hashi is essentially as fast as its slowest oracle. And if you, uh, in our test net, we, we're looking exactly this, this problem uh, that you have message passing bridges which are super fast, uh, like Wormhole, for example, is super fast or our own A and B. And then you have light clients which are a lot slower. So a light client, I mean, in the current test net we have, it takes 30 minutes. So like bridging the state, computing the proof, submitting the proof, verifying the proof. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, there, are implement, there are improvements being done by the uh, ZK Lite client teams implementation. This is a super early, early stage technology. We expect, honestly, that there will be improvements by, by the Lite clients themselves, because this is what slows the whole system down. Um, 
other than that, the, the system is so modular, so you can also customize it. And if you, uh, if you because light clients is like an, a, a, again, additive security, but if you cannot afford at the moment uh, that they are that slow, you can focus on multiple message passing bridges and get rid of the problem. There was another question over there. Hi, thanks. OK, sorry, I'm a bit quiet. So um, your solution, uh, is it not moving the risk from multiple bridges, like, OK, each of them has their own risk, but then you somehow aggregate them? Won't the risk be there? Um, or are there multiple, like, are those the different implementations you were talking about? Yeah. Thank no. you. That's a, a very good point. Uh, yeah, so you're right. I mean, what we're doing is like we're aggregating. So we have different kind of implementations. Of, by implementations, I mean, by the way, different general message passing protocols, different oracles, right? Uh, different like clients and stuff. Uh, so yeah, essentially, the, the risk is transferred to, to, the, to Hashi. Uh, what we do to, to minimize this risk, uh, number one, Hashi, if you look at the code base, is is a very thin layer. So yes, uh, it's, it's not like the, the most complex code base, at least at the current state. So it's super modular. So if you, if you want to strip it down and just focus on, on something that is super well, um, again, audited, understood, and secure, you can do that. There is, there is indeed risk uh, there. Um, but I believe also the governance is, is to, in my opinion, governance was, um, was worse than that. So even if you say, OK, I, I can trust, I can trust. Yeah, that's a bit of oxymoron here uh, since of the, um, uh, the topic of the talk. But if I can say, OK, the hash layer is super thin and I can work with that, if you have a governance that is a multisig that essentially can go any time and replace oracles or change thresholds, uh, this is your single point of failure. This is why we, we started working on this alternative uh, governance system. We have time for one more question. If not, then I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Giorgio. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>